how many people know uh, the population of Pakistan? Wild guess. More. 200 more. So about 220 million. Uh, so its its population is growing. And the reason you need to know about Pakistan is it's also a nuclear weapon state. It is also unstable. So it's important to keep an eye on Pakistan. Um, I, I am not a China specialist. It's just a disclaimer. My area of interest has been obviously South Asia. I've reported from the US, the Middle East. Uh, spent many years at the BBC, a couple of years at Deutsche Welle. Uh, but having been involved with this project, I am more and more interested uh, in China. So what I say here today is uh, from the perspective of a neighbor, looking at China, its influence, its involvement in Pakistan. Um, I, I do want to quickly mention the word dragon in this uh, title. I understand there are some cultural sensitivities which I wasn't really aware of, but I'm not going there. I'm just going to talk about China as Pakistanis see it. And when we think of China, you can either think of uh, the pandas, cute and cuddly pandas, but I think thinking of it as a symbol, as a dragon, uh, makes more sense given how China is projecting its power around the world and in the region. Um, so those of you who are China specialists would know that the dragon is a mythical creature which symbolizes power, uh, divinity, determination. You may not know much about Marhor. Marhor is the national animal of Pakistan. It's a wild goat. It's a reclusive animal. Uh, likes to stay in high altitude mountains. Um, in some ways, I think the two uh, characters symbolize the two nations. Pakistan tends to be a, a nation which is relatively insecure, paranoid about its neighbors. It has had you know, three wars with India. It has bad relations with Afghanistan. So it is in a tough neighborhood and always looking to take care of its security. Marhor is also the symbol of Pakistan's uh, most powerful intelligence agency, the ISI. The ISI, supposedly, is the deep state in Pakistan. It controls uh, politicians. It controls the, uh, has a huge influence on judiciary, uh, and, and society in general. So it's interesting uh, that they use the same symbol uh, as their logo. And in the city of Karachi, where I'm from, you would often see this logo uh, as car stickers. Uh, people use it, I think, to ward off anybody who has bad intentions trying to steal or rob you because they are trying to say, I have connections to the ISI or the deep state. So when, when you think of China, there are uh, cynics in Pakistan, as in many countries. They are in minority. They believe that uh, China's interest in Pakistan is purely economic, transactional. It is coming into Pakistan to exploit its resources, uh, create a debt trap for the country. In the long term, uh, it will not serve Pakistan. Uh, so that is how the minority sees it. The majority is overwhelmingly in favor of ties with China. It sees China as a reliable partner. But before China, I want to briefly mention this relationship. Uh, Pakistan was in the US camp uh, for decades. Militarily, it received a lot of economic aid, uh, military aid, and uh, during the Cold War, uh, it was overtly uh, a US ally. In Afghanistan, it was the frontline state against the Soviet Union. But the relationship uh, was always problematic. Uh, there was a lot of blame game. There was a lot of alleged backstabbing. There was a lot of mistrust between the two countries. And so I think this picture kind of <laughs> explains 
how problematic the relationship is. They had lots of breakups. They would kind of get back together. But this is how a lot of Pakistanis feel used by the US, by the West. Traditionally, Pakistanis have been uh, able to identify closely with the US culturally, democratically. Uh, our people go to universities in the US and UK and Germany. Uh, but increasingly over the last 10 years, uh, this is how Pakistan has felt, and the relationship has soured. So, enter China, um, replaced by the U.S. Not entirely. I mean, Pakistan still has a relationship with, with the U.S. and the West, but it is increasingly going into a tighter embrace with China. Uh, the two countries almost seem like romantic partners at time because of all the poetry that comes along. They talk about the friendship being higher than the mountains and deeper than the oceans. And then they talk about, you know, we are iron brothers. We are all weather friends. And that's a sentiment that, has, that predates uh, BRI or China Economic, uh, China Pakistan Economic Corridor. So over the last 10 years uh, since Pakistan signed up uh, on this project, more than $25 billion have been invested or loaned to Pakistan. Uh, more than 500 kilometer roads have been constructed, power plants, coal power plants initially, and now uh, um, hydropower plants, amounting to about uh, 6,000 megawatt electricity over the last 10 years. Pakistan couldn't have done this without China. And this was at a time when the country was witnessing a lot of terrorism. Uh, the US was turning its back on Pakistan, and China apparently came to the rescue. So this is kind of the bigger picture of everything that has happened um, over the last 10 years. So from renewable power projects to coal power projects, there's a port being constructed over here in Gawadar which is hugely significant for, for China because it will give access. If you look at from Kashgar, it will give access to Africa and Middle East and other places. So that port has, is being built for the last 10 years. It is becoming operational now. But there are problems. Uh, despite a lot of uh, commonalities and everything, there is a separatist insurgency going on in Balochistan. Uh, they don't believe that China coming in and, and investing helps them or their cause. And that is why security has been a major issue. A lot of Chinese engineers and workers have been attacked. There have been suicide attacks on them. The Chinese consulate in Karachi was attacked. And that has now become number one concern for China to operate in Pakistan. Uh, other than that, there are also economic issues. There's a clear sense in the last maybe two years or three years since the pandemic that China is also losing enthusiasm with Pakistan. There are growing frustrations over uh, payments that Pakistan was supposed to make in energy sector and other, uh, other areas. But the two are still trying to manage that relationship. Uh, at no point, despite all the difficulties, have China and Pakistan publicly uh, made accusations or blamed, which was the characteristic uh, between the US-Pakistani relationship. Even when Pakistan was a frontline ally, it was constantly being publicly humiliated and insulted and everything. Uh, and the US felt the same way. The US felt Pakistan was betraying. So the relationship uh, is tight. It is likely to st stay that way. Uh, but there will be challenges uh, along the way. But Pakistan simply cannot afford to, to upset China too much. I'll stop here so that we have more time for Q&A. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for that fantastic presentation. Uh, my name is Brian Timbrock, and I work in the US consulate in Kazakhstan following uh, China's relationship with Afghanistan. I'm wondering if you can talk about how the Taliban takeover in August 2021 has impacted China-Pakistan relations and where you see that relationship going in the future? So obviously for Pakistan, uh, the, the military uh, celebrated 
the return of Taliban. But uh, I think ordinary Pakistanis have been uh, worried for the right reasons because we are now beginning to see increased militancy in Pakistani areas. So it was interesting to see China play a, a significant role in that uh, exit of the of the uh, of the U.S. from Afghanistan. Uh, China hosted Taliban leaders. Uh, it facilitated the the mediation between Taliban, Pakistan, uh, and other nations. Uh, China is interested in keeping uh, Taliban on its side because of its own concerns uh, in Xinjiang and with uh, with Uyghurs, uh, with um, East uh, um, East uh, East Turkestan. Yes, yes, yes. So there are all these militant groups in in Western China, uh, and for that reason, China is trying to keep Taliban on its side by giving them uh, help in terms of uh, financial aid, in terms of facilitating them, engaging with them through Pakistan. But, uh, uh, but it's tricky. I mean, we, we will have to see uh, if this really helps China in taking care of its concerns over security. Uh, Craig Twitt from Internews. Um, I'm interested in uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm interested in the media in Pakistan's uh, representation of China-Pakistan relations and how, if there is a uh, nuanced, complex analysis of that. So when, uh, when the China-Pakistan economic corridor started and all this money was coming in, uh, if we tried to ask questions about transparency, about the, the, the deals, uh, generally, we were told that, you know, let's not ask these questions. You know, we should be grateful that China is investing in a country like Pakistan when our traditional friends have abandoned us. So that's kind of the overriding sentiment about coverage of China. Uh, I would say overall, the, whether it's, it's uh, media organizations or political parties, they feel allied to China. And that is why you wouldn't hear mention of Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, whatever is happening in Xinjiang. Pakistan doesn't want to talk about it uh, because it is not in its interest. So there isn't any active censorship and China doesn't really need to invest too much in Pakistani media to get favorable uh, coverage. It gets it anyways. So you know, uh, it, it, that's why you know, when we were doing the index, I did not find a lot of evidence that they have to pump money and resources. They have created think tanks and they, have, they are funding people to talk more about the benefits of China, uh, but there isn't that kind of coercion or censorship or, or anything like that. Yes. Cambria Hamburg, US State Department. Could you please talk a little more about what uh, Beijing hopes to get out of its relationship with Pakistan, what it sees as its value and its goals? Okay, so one thing I didn't mention, which is again crucial to this equation, is uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend. I'm talking about India. Um, so, you know, India is obviously a major concern for China, for its regional aspirations. And because Pakistan and, and India have a long history of uh, border disputes and uh, in Kashmir, three wars, uh, the two are kind of together in, in kind of, uh, you know, containing India's ambitions. Uh, and it, the alignment over the, over the last several years appears to be the U.S. is more and more interested in ties with India and calls, it, calls India as a strategic partner. Um, and so naturally, Pakistan has gravitated more towards China. And uh, that equation is sort of unlikely to change, uh, mainly because of Pakistan's growing economic difficulties. Uh, yes, you know, it wants IMF and it wants the US on its side, but increasingly it is China which is bailing out Pakistan, giving you billions in loans uh, and then rescheduling them. So. It is mainly the, the economic compulsion uh, which, uh, which makes Pakistan dependent on China. What does China want? Obviously, as, as I was mentioning, uh, you know, having a port here, 
At the moment, they're saying it's for purely economic reasons, but who knows, over a few years, there will be some naval presence because China needs to, uh, you know, I mean, China needs some presence here and Pakistan will happily provide it. The two have already a uh, long history of cooperation in nuclear technology and missile technology. Uh, the, the two militaries are quite thick. And that is why when you look at China and Pakistan, don't just think economics. It's way beyond that. It's strategic. And they help each other, uh, whether it is in the Security Council, whether it is on the ground, militarily. The relationship is really tight. And I think China, China feels that you know, uh, it serves a purpose. That is why it, it calls uh, CPEC, which is China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, as the, uh, uh, you know, as the, as the main uh, m sort of main investment of BRI. It wants to showcase CPEC uh, uh, as the best of the best in terms of investment. Thank you very much Sorry, for I your... totally ignored the site. <laughs> no problem. Everybody over there. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Ray Wong from Freiheitsville, Hong Kong. Um, I have two questions regarding the uh, presentations you gave. First of all, um, Pakistan has always been portrayed as a successful story of the Belt and Road Initiative. But on the other hand, we also see some the downside of the BRI, like Sri Lanka. I wonder if the Pakistani government has changed its perspective regarding the BRI after seeing the downside of BRI. And the second question um, uh, is related to East Turkestan, um, as you have mentioned. Uh, there is not much discussion on this issue in Pakistan. I wonder if there is a dominant narrative justifying why the, um, CCP could do it to your Muslim brother or just basically people don't care about it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Both, both are really good questions. So Pak Pakistani prime ministers have been asked by international media about the situation of Muslims in Xinjiang and what's happening to Uyghurs. They just refuse to talk about it. Uh, they don't even say we will take it up with the Chinese leadership because they can't. Uh, it's, it's beggars can't be choosers. So they, the last thing they want to do is annoy China on that issue because the Chinese leadership is like super sensitive. So it doesn't figure. Pakistan likes to champion the, the Muslim cause when it comes to Chechnya or Kashmir or Palestine, but it doesn't talk about the Uyghurs. So as we know, foreign policy is not necessarily about morality, it's about interest. And your first question was about learning from the Sri Lanka experience. So unfortunately, when, when that happened, there were voices in Pakistan saying, look, we need to learn. This could happen to us. The only difference is in, in Sri Lanka was it Rajapakse who, who signed the deal, right? Um, and with the change of the government, the priorities changed. With Pakistan, the permanent, permanent government is the military. The civilians sort of, sort of come and go, and they usually are powerless, and they're kind of vying for influence, and they're thrown out. But the military is the stabilizing influence. And when I say it's a strategic partnership, it means that institution to institution, so Communist Party of China and Pakistani military, they have decided this will, this is a long-term partnership, romance or an affair, right? So a prime minister may be not super enthusiastic about it, but they have to go along with it because there is no option. It's not like the US is there to help you out. US is, has got its own problems now and it wants to focus more on India. So from that point of view, uh, there, there wasn't that soul searching uh, in Pakistan uh, and that's why there's no discussion on the long-term impact of being dependent on China. So I think the honeymoon period is sort of slightly over, but the worst is yet to come and nobody wants to think about it because it is way too distant. It's about surviving now this year and next year for Pakistan economically. Yes. Uh, 
Hello, thank you for your presentation. I'm Emilia Sorek from University of Fribourg. I would like to ask you something more about Baluchistan and the local situation there. Could you perhaps tell us how many of BRI projects or projects which are part of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, how many of them are actually located in Baluchistan? And could you also tell us something more about the the impact of these investments on the local dynamics and whether Pakistani government is perhaps tempted to instrumentalize the situation against the claims of the local population. Right. I'll try to answer it. Um, so basically, Balochistan is Pakistan's biggest province in terms of landmass, but it is the most uh, sparsely populated uh, province. And for a long time, there's been insurgency running for independence of Balochistan. So when, when China starts building Gawadar port or the roads along here, uh, the Baloch nationalist parties uh, say, we should be benefiting from it, but this is not for us. This is for the federal government, the central government, and the trade will take place from Kashgar to Gawadar. We are not going to benefit from it. Balochistan is impoverished, the most impoverished province of Pakistan. In Gawadar, you, you don't have clean drinking water. And they've built a you know, brand new airport. There's a five-star hotel uh, on a hill where Chinese investors come and stay and they cut deals with local businessmen. Uh, so the, there's a sense of deprivation uh, among Baloch nationalists. Now, Pakistan's official position is that the Baloch militants are being uh, funded by India because India doesn't want uh, BRI to succeed. And so it's trying to undermine by funding them. So initially there were attacks on Chinese uh, engineers. I think it was along Panjgur uh, and, and, and other areas. But now the militancy has become more lethal. In the last couple of years, they've carried out suicide attacks. I believe earlier this year, there was a female suicide bomber which tried to uh, carry out an attack in the city of Karachi. So it is, the resistance uh, is there. Uh, unfortunately, it is becoming more and more bloody. And that is China's number one concern now. That did, did, uh, in fact, last month when Pakistani delegation went to Beijing, President Xi said all our high officials will now be escorted by, by security, they will have bulletproof cars, uh, and you can't, you can't operate in a country like this if, if you're being targeted. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a huge challenge for, for China in terms of going forward. You've made billions of investment, you plan to do more, how will you get around the security issue? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions from our online audience. Uh, the first one is how Pakistan maintain balance in relationship with China and USA. And the second question is how China investment have a positive impact on local Pakistani economy. Yeah. Right. So the balancing act, as I mentioned, between the US and China uh, is obviously going to be a, you know, a tricky one for Pakistan. Pakistan doesn't necessarily want to be anti-American because there's that history uh, with, the, with the US. And I think in terms of aspiration, Pakistan is a parliamentary democracy. And yes, we've had long periods of martial law and military rules and our, econ our democracy is weak, our institutions are weak, but Pakistani political parties draw inspiration from the Western democratic model, right? Uh, our military, identifies closely with China because of its authoritarianism, you know, cracking down on free speech, on free media, controlling politicians, you know, leaving the parliament kind of, you know, worthless. So it's a competing, competing vision for Pakistan. And while you can have good relations with China uh, economically, but ideologically and politically, uh, more people identify with the West than with China. Um, so that's that's one point. And the Chinese investment uh, received like positive feedback. <laughs> right, right. So again, I would say, you know, most Pakistanis value Chinese investment. Uh, 
if BRI project or CPEC project hadn't started uh, 10 years ago, Pakistan would be worse off because you would have perpetual power shortages. You would not have these, uh, you know, infrastructure development. Um, so Pakistan, I mean, clearly has benefited. The question that needs to be asked in the light of China index, what I would hope will happen in Pakistan is to be skeptical about it, not embrace it blindly. So five years or 10 years down the road, you are then now turning to China and blaming them for all your, all your problems. So a country obviously should go in, in these arrangements, being aware of long-term costs and not creating that dependency. Because one of the things I've regularly heard from business people in, in Pakistan is when, when Chinese, I mean not Chinese, when the Chinese government comes or their entities come, the local manufacturing dies. You can't compete with the imports. Your markets are flushed with Chinese products and the local manufacturing and entrepreneurship has virtually died. Uh, so that is for the government to think about how to, how to kind of protect it, nurture it, and have a mutually beneficial relationship, not a one-way relationship. Are we nearly done? One more minute. One more minute. <laughs> we open up for last question for Shazab. For if anyone else? No? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>